Welcome to the weekend edition of Front Office Sports Today, brought to you by Invesco QQQ. Invesco QQQ is the official ETF of the NCAA. The future isn't scary. Not realizing its potential, however, could be. In the game of football, the goal is to build a winning team that strives for excellence on the field. And how do you do that? By fulfilling each player's potential for growth. That's like having your starting quarterback throw the perfect spiral for a touchdown. Let's rethink possibility. Invesco Distributors, Inc. Invesco is not affiliated with the NCAA. In this episode, we have two conversations exploring the college sports landscape. We'll hear from our newsletter writer, David Rumsey, on how the 12-team college football playoff is reshaping the season and how we experience it. Later, our reporter, Amanda Kristovich, explains why the presidential candidates have shown their affinity for college football recently. But before we get started, let's look at this weekend's most expensive college football games, according to TickPick. The fifth priciest game is Oklahoma State versus Arizona State, which has an average price of $150. Next is Georgia versus Florida at $209. After that, we have Michigan against top-ranked Oregon at $232. It's followed by Tennessee and Kentucky at $282. And the most expensive average ticket this weekend will be with number four Ohio State coming to number three Penn State at $322. Up next, this is the first year of the 12-team college football playoff, and as the regular season nears the end, we are starting to get a feel for what that's going to mean. My colleague David Rumsey joins us next to take a look at that and some of the weekend's other big stories. Joined now by Front Office Sports Newsletter writer David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, Owen. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on, as always. So the college football regular season is we can suddenly see the end it's on the horizon uh this is the first year of the 12 team playoff uh who's you know kind of in a good position in this expanded format yeah it's been really fun and you're right it is coming up on us kind of sneaking us sneaking up on us but uh next week we're finally going to have the first official college football playoff rankings so we can kind of see who that top 12 top 15 is a uh, full top 25 it's been an interesting season. We've had several lead changes, if you will, at the top uh, number one ranked teams, which is now Oregon. Um, and it's going to be really interesting as the playoff picture comes into focus because it's not going to look like it has in the years past where we're just looking at who are the top four teams, doesn't matter, conference, et cetera. Now we're looking at looking for 12 teams, but not necessarily the 12 best or highest ranked teams because we're looking for those top four ranked conference champions, then another conference champion, and then the best of the best, uh, best of the rest, if you will, from that point. So it's going to be a little complicated and interesting to see how fans react to it. Right. And (laughs) correct me if I'm wrong here, because this is all new to me, but um, the the top four matters, right? Because they get a bye and then the the next eight play each other and move on to to play those those bye teams. Correct. But it's not necessarily your top four ranked teams. The, The teams that get the bye are the top four ranked conference champions. So if we're looking at it right now, if the college football season ended today before this weekend happened, the the buys would go to number one, Oregon, number two, Georgia, number three, Miami, and then number four, uh, BYU. And that's not the number one, number two, number three, and number four teams in the country. That's just, that's the conference champions for the Big Ten, if you will, SEC, ACC, and then the Big 12. And then you'd also have Boise State getting in as the highest ranked group of five champion. And uh, you'd have uh, some really cool matchups of teams hosting other teams on campuses. Right now, if you kind of played that out, you'd have like Tennessee hosting Notre Dame or Texas hosting Texas A&M, Ohio State hosting Clemson and like playoff matchups, which are which I think are going to be awesome because we've seen some really good on-campus games in previous seasons. And sometimes Uh, An Ohio State-Michigan might be a de facto playoff game if both teams have a similar record. But the feeling of a win or go home game at an Ohio State, at an Alabama, something like that, it's just going to be awesome. Yeah, and honestly, where my brain's going is, I remember last year when Florida State didn't make the college football playoff and it was four teams, people were saying, well, you know, this this is an unfortunate situation, but next year we won't have to deal with all this because, you know, (laughs) it'll be 12 teams fans are going to be going berserk. It's just going to be like for different reasons. And, you know, it's like, they're going to see like the, the lower 10th ranked, but uh, you know, we're, but we're not in the playoff or like, I don't understand this format or why are we yeah. playing this team? Anyway, it, it'll, you know, it takes some getting used to. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely will because people are going to be saying, Hey, at the end of the season or close to the end of the season, Hey, here's the top four ranked teams. 
uh, what, just like you said, why aren't they getting the buy? And so you're like, well, no, Miami is going to have to get a buy because they're the ACC champion. And then whoever wins the Big 12 is going to get a buy. And it not, might not shake out that those are the four highest ranked teams. And that's going to be some controversy in itself, right? What if you are a top four rank, ranked team, but you didn't win the Big 10 or the SEC? And then now you have to play a first round playoff game. Maybe you get matched up against a team that is really hot coming into the playoffs and you're saying, what the heck, I, you know, why is BYU getting a bye, bye week while we have to go play before, you know, we have several more games to try to win a national championship. So college football will never, never not have controversy and things to argue over. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Do you see any particular surprises in terms of who's in right now, who's out, um, you know, based on, you know, previous years? Well, you look at Alabama there in their first season without Nick Saban. If you took the AP rankings right now, they would technically be outside looking in, I guess. Um, so I, I guess that can be surprising, but there's there's still season to play, right? Uh, LSU is also out right now, uh, but, it, but it is interesting. You know, you have, like I keep talking about BYU, but they're in the Big 12 now. They're undefeated. Wouldn't necessarily normally get a look for the college football playoff, maybe. Uh, or then you have Boise State, they're finally going to get their chance to play for the college football playoff, right? They for years have been trying to get in, but, you know, they don't have a tough enough schedule. But now uh, at least one group of five school is going to get in. And, you know, personally, I think it'd be cool to see Army or Navy sneak into the college football playoff uh, if they were one of them to win the AAC and, uh, you know, maybe overtake Boise State for that uh, last group of five bids. So some really interesting scenarios. Yeah, that's something you wouldn't see in a in a four team playoff. So yeah, a lot, a lot of fun possibilities. You mentioned that uh, the 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 teams that would be ranked third and fourth are not the third and fourth ranked teams. Those the actual third and fourth ranked teams are Penn State and Ohio. Right. They're playing this weekend, and so there's that you know high profile battle. We also have a high profile media battle where both ESPN Game Day and Fox Big Noon kickoff are going to be there for that game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just the second time this season. And, and it does happen, you know, at least once or twice every season where Fox and ESPN's pregame shows end up at the same school, same campus for a big matchup. I was actually at Colorado last fall when both uh, game day and big noon kickoff were there at the beginning of the hype of the Deion Sanders era. And it was really cool to see, uh, you know, game day take over one spot of the campus and all the kids there and then see Fox take over a different uh, spot of the campus and just kind of the pandemonium that ensues when both of them are there, much less, you know, even just one of them. Um, and, and yeah, so Fox has the game, Ohio State at Penn State. So they're sending big noon kickoff there, which is really in its only third season of traveling full time to campuses like ESPN's College Game Day has been doing for decades now. So there's just kind of some entrenched viewership for ESPN. Uh, and, and it's kind of paying off this year because they're averaging well over 2 million viewers each Saturday morning, and that's on pace to have their most watched season ever. Fox is closer to like 1 million, just under 1 million average, which which is still basically what they were doing last year. So in my mind, impressive viewership all around, but hard to kind of keep up with game day, which has just been, you know, that's what people wake up with. And that's just what they're used to. Right. Yeah. Game day, I think, I feel like has more of a cachet. You know, they've got, you know, all, a lot of ESPN's big names going along with that especially Pat McAfee right. um but um but yeah I guess Fox is you know it's, it takes a while to establish a media property even in this day and age when everything moves so fast uh so I think people are still getting used to the idea of like the Fox traveling show and that being you know also something mm -hmm. that you like get up early for and there's a huge crowd and you know it, it cause creates its own buzz yeah definitely and you know they have urban meyer on cast they still have matt liner so there's still some stars there and it's still an entertaining product and a lot of times that that big noon saturday matchup on fox like penn state ohio state is going to be is the biggest game of the week so naturally people are just going to flip on fox at 11 o'clock 11 30 and you know for the lead into the game just like you would uh for an nfl sunday if, if your favorite game is at one o'clock and just as someone who's experienced both of these shows being in the same at the same game, basically in the same place, is there I mean, you describe it as pandemonium. Like, is there any like actual like logistical challenges or like, I don't know, like fans figuring out like what they're going to do, <laughs> where they're going to go? Like, like, what was that scene like? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm sure it varies from campus to campus. And sometimes they might be in more you know, closer proximity to each other than than other times. But yeah, I think for the most part, fans may go in between the two or if they 
really, if they're really passionate about one side or the other, they're going to try to get up close and personal so they can be in that front row, get on the cameras for either game day or uh, for big noon kickoff. Um, you know, when I was there, there was no Pat McAfee field goal kicking challenge, which I wish I could have could see because that just turned into a viral sensation this year with uh, a couple lucky students getting those hundred thousand dollar payouts. But yeah, overall, just um, you know. It, Awesome to see them on campuses. Yeah, and actually, just to follow up on this, I mean, when I was um, when it came to to Berkeley to Cal game day did. Yeah. Um, I, I've I've already told this story, but like people were, I, I woke up at four in the morning. I could hear people like at the stadium, like gathering for game day. I don't live that close to campus. <laughs> it's like a mile and a half or something. So um, yeah, I, I'm just wondering, like having seen it live. To what degree is this like a, like a real fan experience or, or are you just kind of like watching a TV product, but you can just like kind of be there in the background and like listen in? Or is it like how much is are, are they like really like, you know, working with the crowd? Yeah, it's wild. And for ESPN specifically, they don't just have college game day on Saturday morning. They kind of set up shop all weekend and they do the Pat McAfee show and college football live on Friday afternoon. So there's other opportunities to have fans get out there and kind of get the juices flowing, if you will, for the students on site. And yeah, I mean, there's obviously lots of commercial breaks, right? So in between, there's sometimes like a DJ playing and keeping the fans going. And yeah, like you said, if you're at uh, on the East Coast, it's 9 a.m. early, but not that early. But if you're on the West Coast, like you said, 6 a.m. is when that game day starts. And, you know, got to probably get there 3, 4 a.m. to get a good spot. So, you know, I think they're saying kids are camping out or, you know, staying up all night. Um, you know, keeping themselves, uh, you know, maybe some Miller light or whatever to keep them going. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, l- there's uh, one other game I wanted to touch on before we let you go. Uh, Florida and Georgia are playing in Jacksonville this weekend. Um, in the future, they're going to play a couple games in Atlanta. What's the story there? Yeah. So the Jaguars stadium is getting $1.4 billion at least worth of renovations. And it's going to have some reduced capacity in 2026 for the Jaguars NFL schedule, then be closed entirely in 2027, which is going to force the Jags to, ironically enough, maybe go play a couple games at Florida Stadium down in Gainesville. But yeah, this iconic Florida Georgia game, one of the oldest neutral site college football rivalries, almost always played in Jacksonville going back until 1933. It's going to be played in Atlanta and Tampa in 26 and 27. So pretty interesting that it's going to still be neutral sites, still be NFL stadiums, but have a little bit more of that home and home feel, right? Because Atlanta, not that far from Athens for Georgia, Tampa, not that far from Gainesville for Florida. And if you listen to coaches talk, they're even saying it this week um, ahead of the game, Kirby Smart and Billy Napier, you know, it, they wish it could be a home and home, like a lot of other, like Alabama, Auburn, for uh, example, something like that, uh, because of the recruiting purposes, you want to bring your, top prospects to the swamp for the game against Georgia, entertain them and show them what it's like. It's not as much fun to bring them to a neutral site game. Um, But they admit just there's so much revenue that comes with playing at an NFL stadium with all the luxury boxes, all the suites, all the sponsorships they can sell for the Florida Georgia game. But yeah, it is going to be interesting to see what it looks like uh, in 26 and 27 when it is Still neutral site, but I, I bet you there will be some tweaks in Atlanta and in Tampa that it will feel a little bit more like a Georgia home game, a little bit more like a Florida home game. Before we let you go, uh, other than Ohio State, Penn State, uh, any any matchups this weekend you have your eye on? Yeah, Oregon is visiting Michigan, which is now a Big Ten matchup, and that it's in that old CBS three thirty uh, in the afternoon uh, SEC slot, which was for years the game of the week uh, from the SEC on CBS, but it's going to be. Oregon at Michigan and, you know, Oregon favored to win still the top team in the country, but it's never easy playing in the big house. So that that'll be a good one as well. Yeah. Sounds good. David Rumsey. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah. Thank you. Next presidential candidates have been discovering their inner college football fan. Recently, I spoke with the reporter, Amanda Christovich on what they're doing and why that's coming up next. I'm joined now by front office sports reporter, Amanda Christovich. Welcome, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Good. Good to have you on. So you wrote about how the two presidential campaigns are using college football. What did you find there? 
Yeah, I, um, it, it's interesting because I remember at the beginning of my sort of front office sports career was the 2020 election. Um, and if you remember, there was a moment where um, Donald Trump tried to take credit for the Big Ten uh, sort of restarting their football season in the middle of COVID. He said that during a debate, it was very unexpected to say the least. And I ended up writing sort of about why he thought that that would help him. Um, and, and sort of the answer was that, you know, the, the importance of college football to many folks in, you know, college towns and states that happen to be swing states um, are some of the biggest sort of like college football brands. Um, that's still true. Uh, I, I found um, that there was actually like an uptick in sort of political advertising, um, an uptick in just sort of showing up to games. I mean, obviously during 2020, there weren't really a ton of games to show up to, uh, but Trump went to the Georgia-Alabama matchup. He wanted it on the pageantry, um, you know, and, and both candidates have really been using the college football platform as one of their many opportunities to reach a certain demographic of voters in, you know, the several swing states that they're really trying to target at this sort of late stage in uh, the cycle right before the election. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's there's a few threads I want to pull on here. I also believe Trump tried to blame Ron DeSantis for Florida State not making the college football playoff <laughs> last year. Um, I don't quite remember the the logical thread there, but I, I think there there is some. He may try to make some tie there. Um, but yeah, so I, obviously there's like the geographic part of it, right? Where the swing states are generally not coastal ones. College football is you know largely centered in the middle of the country. So there's that just kind of like, I want to reach these demographics. Right. One way to do that is is college football. I also, and maybe getting ahead of myself here, but I wonder like to what degree college football just has a different feel to it than the NFL, than Major League Baseball, than other, other than the professional sports um, that might just kind of fit better with kind of like, you know, especially because like working class voters are such a, um, a fought over constituency right now. I'm wondering if the college football somehow fits better with that feel that the campaigns are, are going for. Yeah, I mean, look, I spoke with one sort of political expert who pointed out to me, uh, I mean, look, you know, obviously uh, there are plenty of female viewers in college football and the NFL, but um, obviously the, you know, sports in general, men's sports are known for drawing male voters. That's certainly a demographic that Trump is, is trying to target. Then there's also this question of, you know, sort of the youngest um, group of eligible voters who we know, many of whom are on college campuses, right? So you sort of kill two birds with one stone with college football in a way that you may not in the NFL. But I will say, you know, that of all the sort of impressions, the hundreds of millions of impressions that the Trump and Harris campaigns and the sort of larger packs that are supporting them have received through college football, they've received even more through the NFL. Um, you know, the NFL and college football are one, two in terms of those um, impression numbers when you look at all of the major sports. I mean, look, Obviously, um, I was at the World Series. By the time you'll see this, it will have been last night. I'm a Yankee fan. I don't want to talk about it. But the world, as we know, the World Series, you know, had this season in baseball was record breaking, but it still usually doesn't quite measure up to the NFL numbers. There are sort of fewer games. The postseason lends fewer opportunities, um, you know. But NFL is like sort of a gross eyeball situation. Like the number of people is going to be higher than college football, but college football is a more targeted demographic. Right. Yeah. I was sort of finding myself pulled in two directions when I thought about this. So on right. one hand, yeah, college football, you get a very regional audience. Like if Wisconsin's playing, you get a lot of the state of Wisconsin right. watching that game. At the same time, yeah, it's also the probably the second most popular thing just in terms of like pure eyeballs per game. Um you you get yeah it's it's the NFL's number one college football is probably number two so you mm -hmm. do have to be getting some national reach there. There are big games like Georgia Alabama, um, like 
Michigan, Michigan State, you know, hammering Michigan really hard, but, you know, it's it's still an important state. It's still a, a probably, at least for a lot of people, a national, you know, a, a game of national importance, right? Um, there are plenty of examples of those types of games where either one or both games, um, you know, sort of like the teams hail from swing states. Um, and then you add this sort of there, you know, most of these matchups are garnering at least five million viewers. Like, and I'm being super conservative with that that number, right? Um, so you add sort of the re- it, it, it's like the highest number of eyeballs you're gonna get for a targeted audience is college is what is how I would describe the value of college football. And again, that's political ads, but it's also in person. Um, appearances because those in-person appearances, obviously, you know, there's some schmoozing that goes on in person, right? Like Trump gave out hot dogs or whatever at Georgia, Alabama, but there's this social media aspect of it that there's sort of organic content coming from these events. And, you know, it could either work for or against the candidates in the case of uh, vice presidential candidate Tim Walls, um, you know, sort of Trump accounts on X picked up videos of him getting booed by fans and juxtaposed it with Trump getting cheered by fans, et cetera, et cetera. So there's that sort of online aspect as well. Right. And yeah, that's the other thing I was going to bring up is there's like, you can pay for ads as, you know, as Trump did for the World Series. And yeah, you can also just show up at a game and someone's trying to associate yourself with, you know, right. like, I'm into college football. Like, I get college football. Like, I'm, if you're into college football, like we are, we're, we're, we're aligned here. Um, right. And again, I think that like lends itself to the college football brand where it, it just feels like regional. And like, you know, if you show up at a, you know, like a Michigan, Michigan state game, like you care about the same things that I do, because like, I've been thinking about this game all week. And now like this presidential candidate is here, or, like, you know, that's, that's got to do something for them. And I feel like that might do more than, I don't know, like being at like a Tigers game or a Red Wings game or I mean, part of it's just the reach, but I think part of it's the the CFB brand. Right. And then add in just the simplicity of the timing of all of it. Right. I mean, um, like I said, Major League Baseball has had a ton of eyeballs this postseason, but, you know, the sort of core weeks that there's been a huge uptick in political ad um, impressions and, you know, just ad buys. Right. Um, has been sort of the middle to end of October. And yes, there are important, you know, there's a postseason happening in Major League Baseball, but those games aren't as frequent. So college football, it's like, you know, I guess, and to an extent, the NFL, so many opportunities every single week to, you know, really hammer the states that you are, you know, where there are voters that you're interested in reaching, right? Georgia, Nevada, North Carolina, Michigan, Wisconsin, right? Like these are um, all places with multiple teams that, you know, are in the FBS division or the power conference divisions. Yeah. And is realignment messing with this equation at all? Just because, I mean, now college sports, college football, especially is less regional. We have California teams, you know, playing on the East coast is, is yeah. Do, I mean, obviously you can like target which games you want to go to, but yeah. Does realignment kind of like screw with us a little bit? Yeah. I was kind of wondering that. Um, this is just my analysis. It's not a question that I ended up posing to political experts, but um, I would say you would think so because we've talked about all of this, like, coast to coast, um, you know, travel and these new matchups, right? Like UCLA versus Michigan, right? And the Big Ten, for example, or Stanford versus Duke. But I, I would say, you know, there, there still are, in many cases, those traditional matchups that are going to be, you know, interesting for the candidates to sort of pounce on or important, you know, think games that they want to get involved in. Um, but then the other thing I'll say is like, you don't need like both teams uh, to be in swing states, right? Like um, 
the USC UCLA brand, for example, like there was ad spending in games where UCLA and USC played. California, obviously not a swing state, not even close. But if they're playing a team that's in a swing state, the sort of intrigue of that matchup and the and the larger audience in general maybe even nationally that that game might draw you know could bring some extra eyeballs that could be useful to one candidate or the other yeah yeah very interesting and i'm just wondering if there's sort of other curiosities that you found uh when exploring all this stuff you know one thing that i found interesting um the, the hundreds of millions of impressions for advertisements are coming from college football and the NFL. Um, you know, over, you know, over a hundred ad buys between the two candidates um, for college football this season. That's not even including the packs. Um, so those numbers are really high, but the spending number itself isn't very high. Um, no, no entity that I researched um, was estimated or confirmed to have spent more than $2 million on college football this season, which I find interesting because you would think the number would be higher, but I, I think it's because so many of these games are regional that the price of, of these advertising spots may just not be like the price that we're used to seeing. You know, it's not like it's the Super Bowl. Um, so it does seem like they're getting a lot of bang for their buck. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. And, you know, obviously something campaigns have to think about the, the less yeah. less so now that they're all making, you know, bringing in billions of dollars. Amanda yeah. Grosovich, very interesting stuff. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for today. Subscribe to Front Office Sports Today on the platform of your choice and tell your friends about the show. Thanks for listening. We will see you on Monday.